Good afternoon and good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. My name is Abby Lester, and I'm the director of the JDC Global Archives. I'm delighted to welcome you to today's special lecture. We commemorate Yom HaShoah this week. In fact, today, April 19th, is the 80th anniversary of the start of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. JDC Warsaw, our office in Warsaw, played a major role in providing assistance during wartime in Poland, and particularly the Warsaw Ghetto. It supported health, welfare, cultural and educational activities in the ghetto, and helped finance the underground schools and youth movements. Dr. Emanuel Ringelblum, a department head of JDC Warsaw, oversaw the underground Oneg Shabbat archival, archival group, which secretly recorded everyday life in the ghetto providing an eyewitness account of Nazi atrocities. Our lecture topic is fitting to this time of reflection on the Holocaust. But first, a few words about the archives. The JDC archives, with locations in both New York and Jerusalem, houses the records of the organization since its creation over 100 years ago. The archives is an unparalleled repository of modern Jewish history. Its vast holdings document JDC's global humanitarian mission, activities, and partnerships from World War I to the present. And in so doing, provides an exceptional perspective on the organization's global humanitarian work in over 90 countries. One of the most important repositories in the world for the study of modern Jewish history, visiting scholars from around the world utilize our unique offerings for their research, as do publishers, journalists, family researchers, curators, filmmakers, and others. To support scholarly research in our collections, we also offer fellowships funded by generous donors. Our program today is co-sponsored by the Feinstein International Center, a research and teaching center based at the Friedman School of Nutrition, Science, and Policy at Tufts University. The center promotes the use of evidence and learning in operational and policy responses to protect and strengthen the lives, livelihoods, and dignity of people affected by or at risk of humanitarian crises. Our main speaker today, Dr. Mary Fitzpatrick, has worked for more than 25 years to address severe food insecurity, first as a humanitarian practitioner and currently as a research assistant professor at the Feinstein International Center, Friedman School of Nutrition, Science and Policy in Tufts University. As a humanitarian practitioner, Dr. Fitzpatrick worked for multiple aid organizations, leading disaster responses in most regions of the world. Her current research spans various aspects of starvation and severe food insecurity, from the biological changes during starvation, especially kwashiorkor, to the livelihoods and food systems through which households access food and meet competing needs in a conflict setting. Dr. Fitzpatrick holds a BS in chemistry from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, an MBA with a concentration in international development from Hope International University, and a PhD from the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy at Tufts. I would also like to introduce Dr. Erwin Rosenberg. Joining us for the Q&A portion, Dr. Rosenberg is the Jean Mayer University Professor of Medicine and Nutrition Emeritus at Tufts University and has published more than 500 articles on topics ranging from child malnutrition to nutritional influences on the aging brain, including functions of micronutrients such as folic acid and vitamin B12. He has been editor in chief of Nutrition Reviews, the Food and Nutritional Bulletin, and the Tufts Health and Nutrition Letter. Dr. Rosenberg was educated at the University of Wisconsin, Harvard, Mass General Hospital, and National Institutes of Health. He was the Thompson Professor of Medicine at the University of Chicago and Dean of the School of Nutrition Science and Policy at Tufts, where he established the Center for Humanitarian Studies, now called the Feinstein International Center. The title of Dr. Fitzpatrick's lecture today is Heroic Medical Research from the Warsaw Ghetto, Preserving a JDC Legacy. Our format is as follows. Dr. Fitzpatrick will speak for about 45 minutes we will then entertain questions. Dr. Fitzpatrick's colleague, Dr. Erwin Rosenberg, will join us for the Q&A. Please note that your microphones are turned off and we will take questions via the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. 
You can send us questions at any time during the lecture. And Dr. Fitzpatrick will now start her lecture. So thank you very much for that uh, introduction. It's, it's truly an honor to be here today um, to present uh, on, on this piece of work. Um, so this is the story of a very precious book, a piece of work the JDC published immediately after World War II. The main message I wanna get across in this presentation is that sometimes the value of research is more than just the scientific results. Um, the act of research is sometimes meaningful, um, providing a voice to a population's experience. It's sometimes um, an act of, of defiance um, and, and of, of people facing oppression or a calamity. Um, this work presents uh, some of each of these. Um, the scientific value, voice, defiance, um, both the content and the story behind the book seem to touch so many people when they hear about it. So Tufts and uh, JDC, the JDC decided in collaboration, um, we would make a presentation like this as broad as, broad as we could. Now, I'll give you some background on the book, some of what it contains, how the book came to light um, in, recently, um, some of our efforts to publish it. And finally, I'll dip into a bit into the content um, and sell it, some of its relevance today, both to research and to society. Um, the title in, in, um, in Polish and then in French, Cheroba uh, Glodowa, and Malady de Famine. Um, this, this work was conducted, uh, was carried out by 23 Jewish doctors who were residents of the Warsaw Ghetto themselves. Um, and facing starvation themselves, having it all around them in their work, they, they decided to, to document this, um, to um, document the monstrous effects of, of the Nazi policies. So the team was led by Dr. Israel Milakowski, um, and he's sort of the, the um, Fauci of, of the Warsaw Ghetto. He was the chief of the Department of Hospitals and, and Public Health. Um, and th these, uh, the, the studies that are contained in this book, or the, the articles contained in this book, they were carried out in hospitals that were enclosed with, within um, the Warsaw Ghetto. And it used volunteers often with um, uh, equipment that they had to smuggle in, into the ghetto. Um, some of the results results were destroyed um, in the process of while they were conducting the the experiments. Um, while they were conducting the studies, they were they were destroyed by the Nazis. Some some of the patients and doctors were murdered during the during the documentation. Um, but six articles survived um, to be smuggled out. Um, and preserved after the war. They were actually smuggled to uh, a sympathetic uh, Polish doctor in the Warsaw Hospital. And he had the, the manuscripts buried in the cemetery of the hospital. Um, and then they were dug up and preserved um, after liberation. At that time, they took it to um, a, one of the doctors, the, one of the authors that was uh, survived in, was living in, Warsaw, and they took it to him and to the JDC for, for publication. Unfortunately, very few of the doctors survived even a year after the, um, the articles were written, much less um, survived the war um, um, to see its publication. In fact, um, uh, Dr. Applebaum, who was the editor, um, the, the surviving doctor that that put the um, the that helped with the publication. He actually died a few months before the, the final printing. And his colleagues said he died of a, of a broken heart from all his, his experiences in, in the ghetto. Um, so this work was, was carried out really at the risk of being killed um, if they were seen conducting it because they were documenting these, these monstrous effects of, of the Nazi policies. So the topic of the research is extremely sad but it's presented with such dignity and earnestness that it really, um, it adds to its poignancy. Um, and the studies were mostly observational. 
but they also include um, some autopsies and mild interventions. They used volunteers um, and followed very strict ethical considerations um, in conducting the, the studies. So why are we talking about this book now? Um, the, we found the, the book ha has experienced periods of, of obscurity. Um, I found the book conducting um, a, a literature research for in, in French because we had pretty much exhausted the, the English language um, literature searches. So I was looking for new data um, on perspectives on starvation and came up with a, a source in our own in our very own library. So I, I went to um, down into the basement of the library amongst these these bookshelves. And I, I pulled this um, this copy off the shelf, and it, it was just this little book. It's not a very big book, um, but pulled this book off the shelf, and um, it was yellow with age. It's, it's crumbling. The pages break when I open it, and I opened it to the foreword, and I started reading it, and I was just floored by it. Um, it, it really impacted me, and so I. Um, uh, I'll read you some excerpts from from that forward, but um, before I do that, I'll I'll explain a little bit about the ghetto and and the and the environment in which that that forward was written. So um, the the Nazis in, invaded Poland in 1939 and 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 quickly began to um, began their to reduce the liberties of, of the Jewish population and with these different um, rules, the, where they could go, what they could do, um, what they could own. Um, and the, the quickly everyone had to move into this one Jewish quarter um, of the city, non-Jews had to move out and they enclosed it, um, put gates on it. Um, and eventually the, the Jewish population was not allowed even out of the ghetto except in the, with special passes, it was very exceptional, and they had limited the amount of food going into the ghetto. Um, the The ration at one point was as low as 180 calories, which is like um, you know, it's like a couple of pieces of bread, like a couple of pieces of Wonder Bread, um, but it, or a half of a cookie, maybe a, a one soda. Um, but with smuggling stuff, they eventually, on average, it was about 800 calories. Um, a person, which is really about a third of what most adults need. Um, that's in comparison to about 2,600 calories for the Germans. Um, at one point, the, so the, you have this intense, uh, intense environment um, where, where food is a real issue. And, and at one point, the, the ghetto held up to um, 450,000 people. This is within a couple of square miles. Uh, you often had multiple families living in single rooms. The ghetto was cramped, it was crowded, it was bustling, um, people on top of people. Um, and that is until death from disease and starvation and deportation to Treblinka um, reduced that population. So at the time this um, forward was written, it had gone down to about 10% of that original population. Um, this was written on the eve of destruction of the ghetto. Um, and it was written by the, the editor, um, Israel Milikowski. Um, and when he talks of silence and emptiness, that silence and emptiness that's caused by, um, by death um, and the, the missing people um, are for the most part um, dead. Um, so the, I'll, I'll read this now. Uh, these are just excerpts from that forward. The torment of words. Never have I felt this sentiment with such force as in this moment when I must write this foreword to this work. The times are extraordinary and the work undertaken and executed in these conditions is extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. I hold my pen in my hand and death is all around me looking into my room. She looks at me through the empty windows of houses abandoned and sad along the street deserted and full of miserable remnants of plundered goods. It's difficult to concentrate thoughts, 
but how much more difficult is it still to express the state of mind which invades me and penetrates? Too pale, too poor is our language to express the infinity of our misfortune. I am looking for the right word. I feel pain in formulating it. Alas, in vain, I cannot find it. The present work is not finished. On July 22nd, 1942, it was abruptly interrupted. This was the most critical day in the existence of the Warsaw Ghetto. It was the first day of deportation, of the expulsion rather, of the, I, that is the mass murder. Yes, deportation and mass murder are synonyms in the current moment of our ghetto. Deportation constitutes an action without parallel in history and whose monstrousness and its enormity and in its horror will appear before the world only in the future. Let us proceed with serenity and silence before this action, in silence like that which currently reigns in the empty houses of the ghetto's deserted streets. In this universal silence lies the force and depth of a collective suffering and a cry which in the future will shake the world's conscience. Um, Mila Kasi then goes on to, to describe the study. Um, a lot, and, but, he, but he concludes with this. A last few words to, you, to honor you, the Jewish doctors. What can I tell you, my beloved colleagues and companions in misery? You are part of us all. Slavery, hungry, deportation, those death figures in our ghetto were also your legacy. And you, by your work, could give the henchmen the answer, non omnis moriar, which is Latin for, I shall not wholly die. So on reading this, this forward, um, I'm, I'm looking for like um, studies on, on, on starvation and I come across this and, I, and I, I read this, this forward and I realize this is so much more than just a study on starvation. Um, so I, I was blown away and Dr. Irv Rosenberg, um, one of my colleagues and he, he's um, part, taking, participating in this webinar at the Q&A, um, a, he's a fellow researcher in nutrition <clears throat> and also immediately grasped both the social and scientific value of this book. And we, pre, we pushed to preserve this crumbling little book um, and make it more widely known. And this, this webinar is a part of that, of that effort. So um, in, in looking at the background and trying to figure out the history of this book, we, we tapped into the JDA archives which contain a lot of communications between Warsaw and, and New York, the JDC, different JDC offices, to deliver a thousand copies in French. Um, they didn't have an English version at that time. Um, and the JDC in New York did a rapid distribution, about 800 copies uh, throughout the country. Um, and then they held back about 200. And they, they distributed these 800 copies to um, different medical schools, libraries, hospitals, anywhere they thought um, people could use these, these results in, the, in their work. In the, in the final 200, people would, would hear about the book, they would write in and request a copy, um, and the JDC would provide them. And most of these were people in the US, but also um, the, the scan, you can't really see that. That was taken from the archive and it's a, um, it's a letter from a doctor working in Uganda and he wanted to use the results. So he wanted to use this book for training people working, um, treating malnutrition in Uganda. But also there were some from Brazil and Barbados around them. The, the archives also re include some responses from recipients thanking them for copies of this book and um, commenting on the book. Um, this, this includes discussions with Ansel Keys, who was a, a, a pretty famous um, researcher on starvation at the time and talking about the scientific importance and, and possibly an English translation. But there wasn't an English translation and because English in the US is, is the primary language, um, the, the, the book kind of fell into obscurity until it kind of, it was revived again um, in, in 1979 um, when the JDC in collaboration with Columbia University published a, a version in English um, edited by, by Myron Winnick. And at the same time, there was a, um, a symposium launched as part of the, 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 the book launch of this. There was a whole symposium on hunger, but limited copies were printed uh, in, in English. 
Um, and it, um, even, even today, it's, it's, it's quite difficult to, to find uh, a copy. Um, I looked on Amazon, there's one used copy or obviously used one version, one copy on there. Um, and it's like $750. So it's not, <laughs> it wasn't um, very available to researchers. So it's kind of gone out of use and we wanted to correct that. So our first effort, um, um, Irv inter intervened, um, or Dr. Rosenberg intervened at the, at the uh, library at Tufts in order to get a digital copy. So working with JDC who had the copyright and, and um, Tufts Library, it's now available and we can provide the link to that. Um, it's available publicly um, in, in a digitized version. This is the French version. Um, there's also an article on the conversation we wrote. Uh, it was immediately the conversation website um, and it's, uh, it was immediately picked up by Polish and Spanish news sites, numerous news sites in the US. So over a hundred thousand people have seen both that article and a podcast that, um, that came out of that article. Um, it was rebroadcast by NPR on the radio. So additional people. So the word is, is getting out there. And this, this presentation is, is a part of that. And we hope to, to also produce some, um, some peer reviewed work on that. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll dip into the, into the content of the book a little bit. So the, the book contains observations and, um, the six different articles. Um, well, the first part, you know, what were the clinical signs, of um, the, that they observed and with what frequency, how that differed between adults and children. And, and this is a very singular comparison. We don't often have enough adult cases to, to make these comparisons. Um, it talks about metabolic changes to the body, um, how, how the body changed, um, the way it used different types of nutrients. They talk about the um, pathophysiology, um, circulation, circulatory system, um, looking at the heart, um, blood volume. Um, and this was, a, this was particularly important in the, in the refeeding process um, and in later years, this, this, this evidence was changes in, um, in, the, in the blood and, and the bone marrow um, showing some compensations um, that happen in, in the blood and, and volumes of the blood. Ocular disturbances, there's these things called veto spots. Um, there are these little bumps that form on the eye when you have um, a lack of vitamin A. And even though they didn't see these beto spots, there were meaning that they weren't vitamin A deficient, which is really surprising. They, um, they were showing some other changes in, in the eyes. Um, some of the, some of the, path, um, the pathological anatomy. Um, so some of the, the organs they were, were changing. Um, some, some organs were preserved. Um, other organs were, were diminished. So like the, like the liver and the heart were, were, were much smaller than, than they were. Um, so and then finally has some reports of, of um, pure starvation, um, autopsies rather on pure starvation. One thing for me, a researcher on kwashiorkor. So kwashiorkor is a type of malnutrition um, where the, the person gets a lot of edema and it has a very high uh, risk of, of death. Um, they distinguish between that um, kwashiorkor and what we would call wasting, which is when you get very thin. Of course, they called kwashiorkor wet, um, wet malnutrition or wet starvation and, and um, wasting dry. But they made that distinction, which is a distinction that um, a lot of researchers now uh, fail to make, even though there are some very strong um, physiological differences in that. Um, and I found that, that very helpful to my research. So um, in the book, they, can, they, they include a lot of epi epidemiological data, um, giving population averages and monitoring the general population. Which is, which is very important. Um, we don't often get, get that sort of information, um, as well as information on patients themselves that they did with some of the experiments. Um, 
the the actual data in the articles is somewhat limited, but it's it's enough um, to indicate new areas of research that that to explore as well as pushing us to to question some of the assumptions in in current research. Um, it also includes the the book also includes some some picture plates that were taken around the ghetto. Um, I don't think these were taken by the um, the twenty three authors, but um, they were apparently owned by plates that were owned by the JDC and, and put in this book. And they're most most of the pictures included in the book were of um, patients in, in the hospital demonstrating different things. Um, and one of the one of my takeaways from looking at these pictures is we, we usually think of very young children when we think of malnutrition, especially in an emergency. And um, although young children were especially vulnerable, um, adolescents and adults were, were clearly not exempt. Uh, the, this, that you, you can't, I'm not sure how well you can read the, that table that's in there, um, but it it's, um, gives the, the ages of the people they, they did autopsies on. And they did autopsies on those cases that came through that were um, during a certain period that did, were not complicated by disease. So they're, they're pure starvation. And you can see most of these um, are in their 30s, 40s, and 50s, so um, middle age there. Um, there's there's a certain relevance beyond just the the, the science um, to mass starvation, and this is a um, a policy right now, um, a, a policy issue right now that's in that's in it's very relevant. Um, so the mass starvation of civilians as a part of warfare wasn't wasn't really illegal at the time. Um, it was immoral, but it wasn't illegal. Um, and, and then in 1977, uh, the Geneva Conventions added an additional protocol that made the starvations of civilians as part of combat um, prohibited. Um, there's since then there's been an ICC statute um, <clears throat> that says um, using starvation of civilians as a method of warfare and by depriving them of objects indispensable to their survival. So food is considered an object indispensable to survival, but so is heat. So like last fall when um, the Russian army was targeting uh, sources of heat in the Ukraine that um, that was considered um, a, a violation uh, of this. And then um, there's also a, a recent UN um, resolution to remind uh, warring parties that this is prohibited by international law. Um, now the book provides, uh, the, 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 the studies provide unique perspectives on, on starvation um, because they were, in a very unique condition, very unique situation. And they were able to follow an entire population to, that, to detect trends in, in that population, nutrition related diseases. And that's often in studies, we see a very limited window, um, either during in time or um, the number of people, we don't generally see the entire population. It's generally a section of the population. Um, they were in relatively sanitary situations. So often when we see very high malnutrition, it's in an unsanitary situation. So you're not sure what is the effect of, um, of disease versus of starvation. And in this case, there were enough cases that were, did not have disease that was pure starvation. Um, and they were, the doctors were unable to intervene. They couldn't provide food. They didn't have the food to provide. So um, they, they were, they, instead they, um, just recorded observations um, for the most part. Um, one, of the, one of the things that they, they contribute was um, an observation about the, the impact on immune response uh, of starvation. So they had some cases that they knew had TB, but when they tested them, they would test negative. Other cases, they didn't know they had TB, they didn't have a fever, they weren't manifesting many of the symptoms of TB. And yet when they did an autopsy after, afterwards, they were just um, packed with, with TB. Um, 
And there was there was an absence of autoimmune diseases. So uh, people that had had allergies, asthma, rheumatoid arthritis in this population before um, before the experiences of the ghetto, they lost those autoimmune diseases in the ghetto. And the doctors attribute this to um, the body not being able to mount that um, immune response. And um, I apply this to my work, my own work, because children with quadricore are known to be less likely to test positive for HIV. Um, and we took this to mean that they're less likely to have AIDS. Um, but um, this may be a misrepresentation and something we need to go back and look for. Because if we don't know exactly what a child is infected with, who's, who's mal malnourished, we may provide the wrong treatment. Um, the body also adapts um, for reduced micronutrient intake. Um, so the diets were very limited. Um, they were not nutrient dense, and yet there were none of the nutrient deficiency diseases like scurvy, night blindness, um, rickets, these, all these different things that you would expect to see, they didn't see. Um, so the body, as it, re as it reduced, it's reducing in volume, weight, it's also reducing its energy um, output, and all these things re help to reduce some of the, the vitamin requirements. There may have been other adaptations, and that's another topic for research. Um, but what they did absorb that the, um, all, all, all cells re retained that ability to quickly absorb energy if they were given like a load of sugar. Um, so energy is, is extremely important. So um, this work, like I said from the beginning, we want to, we want to, to emphasize there's both social and scientific um, value to, to research quite often. Um, so although it's been 80 years now since these, these studies were conducted, um, they're still relevant. They're still significant in ways, um, in multiple ways. Um, socially, they, they, they provide, they document um, providing real evidence of atrocities, um, but they also demonstrate um, honor um, and dignity to the victims in the, in the way they portray that. Um, there's, there's scientific evidence um, in these studies that are they're uniquely, um, they're unique and, and hopefully not replicable. Um, they, they document the effects of starvation unto death, um, including starvation uncomplicated by disease in, in a large population. And I, and I say hopefully not replicable because um, when, as now we study uh, starvation, um, severe malnutrition, if we arrive in a place where there's very high rates of acute malnutrition, um, we don't just study them, we don't just observe them, we'll, um, we'll treat, treat that. So hopefully we're not seeing this unto death, um, and especially in, in these large numbers. Um, so, there, there's a lot of value in, in this research. A lot of times we look for the most recent research, the most recent evidence, um, the way uh, science, um, scientific articles are, are written now, they're, they, they, they're necessarily very narrow. There's, there's very little observation um, outside of a narrow uh, focus. There's very little speculation, very little, um, thought um, in there other than something that's very narrow. And looking back at some of the, the, the older research that will contain a lot of these observations, it can help us to reflect and, and question some of the uh, assumptions that we've made um, in, our, in our own research. Um, and when research is conduct, conducted in such um, extraordinary circumstances, um, it can also have a very, um, a very strong impact socially. Throughout the book, they would talk about um, this was lost. Um, like there was a whole study on, on bones and the effect on bones um, that was destroyed and the author was killed um, during one of the, the, the actions in, in, the, in the ghetto, but then they never, come out and it's not a rampage against the Nazis. They just show this happened. 
in a very dignified way. Um, and sometimes I think we can learn from that. Um, so in summary, um, research does not have to be a cold calculating endeavor um, in some remote lab with narrow aims and impact. Even clinical research can provide evidence and voice to shed light on wrongs, uh, on atrocities. Um, sometimes sometimes uh, this involves risk to the researchers, um, but, the but the benefits can, can be generational um, and they can be historic. So these 23 doctors in defiance of, of their captors, uh, they achieved all of these things. Um, none of them really lived to, to see the influence that, that they had, um, which, is, which is such a pity, but um, they, they have really had an impact and um, I feel indebted to them and I'd like to honor them today. Um, so I thank you and um, I pass this back to, to Abby. Thanks, Mary, for um, a really enlightening presentation. We'll now open the floor to questions. Just a reminder, we'll, we'll bring Dr. Rosenberg back um, or in, and we'll open the floor to questions. And as a reminder, your microphones are turned off, and we'll be taking questions via the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Um, the first question uh, is about the ethics of this type of study. Um, and I'll leave it to, to you both to determine um, who would like to answer that. Let me uh, take a first shot. As a physician, uh, I'm deeply moved by the bravery of these doctors. And as a, a nutrition scientist, I even stand in awe of the precision of their observations and their fierce commitment to bear scientific as well as historic witness. Uh, that is their statement uh, on the ethics, in my view. As a medical investigator, uh, I wish that I could reach the heights of medical ethics which these doctors displayed with their own heroism. I think the ethical concerns here are not whether, whether there were shortcuts in the ethics research uh, by these doctors, but uh, how much we can learn from setting the bar on medical ethics from their bravery. I'll add to that a little bit. Um, there were, um, in the 70s, when this, in the late 70s, early 80s, when the English version of the book came out, there was um, um, some people that really didn't understand. They, I think they probably didn't really read into what, the, what had been done. Um, and they questioned the ethics of conducting the research and using, using the, the results of the research. Um, and, you know, as, as we said, they, they couldn't change the situation. Um, they couldn't treat people. Uh, they, were, they were observing it. Um, anybody that they had any sort of experimental um, component to it, they, they, were, they were volunteers. They knew what they, knew what they were in for. Um, so even by today's standards of ethics, you know, this, they, the work they did was exemplary um, and, and it falls within that ex ethics. This is in contrast to some of the work that the Nazis, some of the, the evidence, the research of the Nazis that they did on, on, on prisoners. Um, so uh, it's, um, it's an interesting case in, in, in ethics. Um, Um, I'm looking over the questions that are coming in, uh, and I'm going to uh, group some of them uh, together. Um, 
people are asking for information on the background of the doctors that were involved in the study and specialties that they may have had, as well as also um, more information about the names of the doctors, which would all be listed in, in the document. Um, I don't know if that's something that you can um, speak to, Mary or Irv. Um, it may be, it's obviously fine. If not, and we can we can get back to this person. Um, I'm, I'm looking right now. Um, okay. In here. Leave, the English version doesn't list it. The, the French version lists their, um, their specializations. Um, but there, there was a wide range. They were all medical doctors. Um, there were some that, that also previously engaged in research. Um, there were some that were that focused more on um, the circulatory system, um, cardiologists. Um, there were pathologists. Um, there were some pediatricians. Um, I'm trying to think. But, um, as we ask these questions, I'll, I'll, I'll continue to look in the English version, but it doesn't seem to be there. Um, and, okay. Um, but there was there's a wide range. Uh, of, of specializations. I might, I might also say that um, the uh, the sophistication of their observations, uh, even in the in the setting that they were uh, making these observations, is remarkable. I mean, the qual the the quality of their observations, the the technical. Uh, uh, precision uh, was absolutely remarkable, given the fact that they were uh, they were not only in that setting, but this is this was 1941 and, and 1942, um, and and they were they were uh, making these observations in that setting with uh, a really fierce. Uh, commitment to to getting down the information that could be that could be useful. I mean, it's it's remarkable, and I think um, we should uh, find a way to make their list of these doctors uh, available to to whomever uh, wants to find that. And we, these were these were not just some backcountry doctors either. These were some of the leading minds in Poland at that time. Some of the you know some of the leading minds in Europe at that time. And they were very well read, very very. Um, but yeah, a broad range of of, of skills. Um, uh, actually, there's a question that relates to what you were just speaking about. Um, uh, a comment question. Um, the, this person is was surprised by the lack of observed deficiencies such as rickets or scurvy and was making the assumption that the labs were not very functional at the time and maybe that would explain the observation, but I'm not sure if you can speak to that. Well, let me take a first uh, crack at that. Um, we, we tend to uh, express uh, nutrient requirements uh, uh, for the prevention of, of malnutrition uh, based on uh, observations with uh, generally healthy people. Uh, and uh, here we have a setting in which uh, the, the truly rate limiting nutritional factor was calories. And this was this was uh, this was serious uh, starvation, uh, unintervened, and I think what uh, what we can take from their observations is that when the when the truly limiting nutrient is, is our calories, which uh, one could uh, uh, understand that as a as a, a a way in which uh, the organism is protected uh, from uh, from death, that that uh, 
that the requirement for the other nutrients uh, is, uh, is significantly decreased. And I think that that's uh, why we didn't uh, see in this, these observations, uh, scurvy and rickets and uh, other uh, you know, uh, manifest vitamin deficiencies. Um, well, maybe I can add on to that. Uh, we don't have information on growth growth rates, um, and often in in times um, of deficiency, you'll see the the growth rate um, slow, and part of that would help compensate and reduce the requirement. So you're not building new bone. You would just be trying to maintain the bone. And, and that could possibly um, help with that as well. But um, some of the, the softness of the bone, you, you should be able to observe. Now, they did have some functioning laboratories because they did, um, in the autopsies, they did look at bones. Um, and they did find that the body was mining the bones for minerals um, in the adults. And so they, um, they were headed in a direction that would have been very difficult to recover from in the adults to rebuild that bone. Um, so malnutrition, even if you can build on your flesh later, um, it is going to have long-term impacts on, on, your, on the adult life for, for, the, for the rest of that person's life. Um, there were a couple of questions. Um, referring to similar studies or um, episodes of extreme food scarcity. Uh, for instance, um, Ukraine terror famine, the Dutch hunger winter, and it's um, uh, and if you could comment on maybe what has been learned from the, the different episodes. Yes, um, thank you, B, for that question. <laughs> Um, so um, the, the Dutch, I'll take that one or, um, to start with. Um, the Dutch hunger winter um, is often used as, as an example because um, similar to the, the ghetto, you, you had an intact society um, and a lot of the societal functions continued to, to work and the health system continued to work um, throughout that time. And, the, and the, the, the malnutrition was during a discrete time. It was a certain number of months. And people, the health records were, were immaculate in, 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 in the Netherlands. So you have from birth to death, um, multiple generations leading up to and after that period of hunger. And so um, there are, are studies that have gone back and actually looked in detail at the, um, the, the health um, outcomes of people um, that were young children during that time, that were conceived during that time, that were born during that time, or immediately afterwards, um, and the the intergenerational impact. So the impact of where you were in your development, your physical development, um, and where your mother was during that time. You know the experiences of your mother. Um, and how that has impacted even, you know, to the, the second and third generation. Um, so having detailed information like that um, on disease incidents um, and, and the timing on that ha has, has taught us tremendously. Um, the Ukraine terror famine, um, so there were two parts to that famine. Um, and the first part was more incidental to bad policy. And the, uh, the second part was more um, intentional um, and was was considered um, that more of a genocide. Um, and that one we have more, um, and, but um, be, correct me if I'm wrong, um, I, I believe in that one, it's more epidemiological information. So it's information on a whole population versus the individual um, impact on the body. Um, so there's 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 different studies that are that are like that. There was a study in Minnesota that was conducted during World War II um, by Ansel Keys, where um, some conscientious conscientious objectors um, 
uh, instead of serving in the military, volunteered to be starved and studied. And um, there were about 40 of them, I believe. Um, and so they received a diet of 1600 calories, which our, our friends in the ghetto were getting 800. So, um, and some of, some, of those, um, those, some of those men dropped out before um, the end of the study. But that one also observed a lot of their, their psychological changes, their attitudes towards food, their, their social um, implications, as well as their, their physical changes. But um, afterwards, in, in analyzing and publishing that, and so Keyes actually used information from this Warsaw Ghetto studies um, in his studies. I would just add that um, uh, we certainly uh, would expect that uh, studies of uh, population studies of famine, uh, even as uh, famine was imposed in the Ukraine study that uh, was mentioned by uh, uh, by the uh, the Stalin uh, government. Uh, these were studies. These were studies of populations. The thing which is uh, quite unique about uh, about this book uh, and its studies is that it really are pers uh, personal uh, uh, individual observations uh, uh, about the impact of starvation. You know, starvation may be a common uh, uh, event uh, in populations uh, in, in settings of famine, but, uh, but the observations that are made uh, in those uh, populations, often retrospective, are, are nothing like the, the precision of, uh, of starvation that, that was observed uh, by these doctors. Um, along these similar lines, um, there's a question about whether starvation studies have been done on North Koreans who have fled to South Korea, um, as well as maybe a little more background on the Dutch hunger period. Koreans, I can't really comment. Um, okay. I, um, yeah, I can't really comment on that. Do you know anything about that? Or? Well, I don't think Mary is uh, is in direct contact with the North Koreans uh, about their their medical situation. I might just say uh, of interest, though, uh, given the fact that uh, this this uh, webinar is uh, co-sponsored uh, by by the Feinstein International Center uh, at uh, at Tufts. Uh, which started as a center for study of famine and in larger things, that um, one, of the, one of the first uh, settings in which a study was uh, being done by, by members of, uh, of this uh, uh, now Feinstein study group uh, was in uh, North, uh, North Korea because of the serious famine that was going on there in, uh, I guess, the uh, 1990s or so. And uh, uh, there, uh, we, we, we can probably come up with uh, some of the reports of that. Um, the Dutch hunger winter is an interesting example, of obviously, uh, also contemporary with the with the Warsaw Ghetto uh, uh, problem, uh, and uh, there again you have the um, uh, you have external forces that uh, created a, a, as Mary pointed out, a, a specific uh, time uh, interval of of. Uh, of famine and starvation, um, which again, uh, I think uh, most of our uh, information uh, uh, is not about the uh, acute effects of starvation at the time, but, but about the, the important generational effects that, 
that kind of deprivation can can achieve. Um, we have a little more time for questions, uh, and I just wanted to see if we could get through a couple more. Um, there are two different questions about potential participants or um, doctors working in this study. One is, and for, forgive my pronunciation, Dr. Janusz Korzak, I think. Um, his ghetto diary doesn't mention um, that he was a part of it. And Dr. Ludwig Hirschfeld, um, an expert in blood typing, um, a microbiologist and serologist, a resident of the Warsaw ghetto, if you know if they were part of that, involved in, in the group um, at all? Um, they're not listed among the authors. Okay. Um, they may have been consulted or something like that. Um, not, all, not all doctors in the ghetto um, participated in this. And I think that was partly um, because this there was a high risk. If This was hidden from the Nazis. Um, there's a question on that. This was hidden from the Nazis. Um, at that time, Jews were not allowed to conduct any research, but if they were found conducting research on something like this, um, yeah, they would have been, they would have been killed and the, um, Im immediately and their, um, their research would have been destroyed, um, completely. So, um, they may have gone to advice to other doctors, but, um, and the others may have known something was going on, but um this this because of the risks this would have been kept very close to their chest um and i i looked on the list you know, i had the list of the doctors here so i looked for these these two doctors um named and, and they're not on the list that doesn't mean that they didn't have some role but they were not they were not major players or in the, in this okay um and interesting Interestingly, though, we did get a comment from someone on one of the one of the um, people that their father had participated in it, and had and that and they had and that had been meaningful enough that he had passed that down to his next generation. That experience. I agree. There are other there are other questions, of course, and we will be sending both of you. We're out of time, but we be, will be sending both of you um, a copy of all the questions. Can you, um, Mary? Can you put up your last slide one more time with the your contact information uh, for both of you, please? And sure. um, that was another question that had been asked. Um, and I'd like to thank you both. Um, course. Um, I hope everyone has found this interesting, especially this week during commemoration of the Shoah. Uh, I want to extend our gratitude to the Feinstein International Center for co-sponsoring this program and to Isabel Rohr and Abra Cohen from the JDC Archives for organizing the program and providing technical support, respectively. Our next webinar will take place on May 3rd. Dr. Jonathan Sarna will give a lecture entitled, We Are Working for a Healthy Generation, a lecture marking a century since the reorganization of the JDC and its transformation into a permanent organization to meet the needs of world Jewry. You can register for it through our um, archives, our JDC Archives Facebook page and link in the chat. We hope that many of you will be able to join us. Additionally, please feel free to sign up for our e-newsletter um, if you'd like to be added to our mailing list for public programs. And thanks again, Mary and Irv. Um, I appreciate you spending some time with us. Thank you for the opportunity. <laughs>